mindfulness practice going? How do I continue my mindfulness at work and when I get back into my ordinary life? And what, what can I do? What? And these people were people who had been around for a long time, been done a lot of retreats. And it's not uncommon at the end of retreats to give a whole series of advice about how to do that. And so it didn't really seem appropriate or I wasn't particularly motivated to go through the list of the usual things that, that we might say. And uh, I thought, what could I say that's different f- for them, that would be useful for them to hear? And so I told them something that um, kind of, I think both of them kind of like were a little bit stunned. And, um, you know, and they kind of were surprised and like that they could see that their brain was kind of turning, like, well, what's this? Or how does this work? Or can I take this seriously? Or is this for real? Or is this all that, is this all that, this all Gil has to say? Uh, I, you know, that it was, you know, pretty simple in some ways, it's easy to say. But uh, so before I tell you what this is, I want to kind of uh, uh, build up the importance of what I'm about to say. Because if I just tell you what it is, you won't kind of appreciate how important this is. So um, I will take my time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, so uh, this thing that I would say is one of the primary ways, probably not only to support mindfulness in ordinary life, but almost any spiritual life that's a life, a way of living, um, is supported by this. And not doing this, doing the opposite, is uh, really uh, kills mindfulness, really kind of desiccates it, you know, t- or squashes it. And probably the same for most spiritual lives of any kind, including a Buddhist life. It's that important. And, um, and if you want to learn something about yourself, uh, which is partly what we do mindfulness for, to really have insight into our operating system, how we work. To understand, for example, where, you know, really understand the nature of, of our attachments, how we're attached, how we get caught, um, how our sense of self is entangled with the world and pulls us into all kinds of messes and problems. Uh, how we, uh, you know, if you want to understand how it is that we get so unconscious so easily, many of us, so kind of not in touch with our deepest values or deepest motivation. Um, you know, following the advice I gave these two people is probably one of the best things you can do. And, but if you don't follow it, if you do the opposite, it's really, you know, pretty serious, you know, and the, and the, the damage it does not only to ourselves, but also to our society and to people around us. It's a pretty bad thing. In fact, uh, it's not fairly common for people to do the opposite of what I say. And in fact, it's, it's so bad that I think it's reasonable to call it a sickness. And it's a sickness which is contagious. And I suspect that not just a few of you have spread the virus. And when you hear what this advice is, some of you, I think, will turn off me, just like stop paying attention. It'll just seem too impossible. And and it might seem like it's just, you know, ridiculous. And that it doesn't belong in any kind of reasonable modern life it's just like, this guy's crazy. And uh, so, now you'll find out. So is that, have I built it up enough? <laughs> Are you on the edge of your seat, either to know what this is, or ready to kind of like, this is ridiculous. Maybe you have important things to do. And coming here, you wanted to get, you know, to the point quickly because there's a lot of Buddhist teachings to get through and you want to get through them, you know, and learn what they are and, and all this emphasis on, you know, this hyperbole and this all this kind of talking, you know, it's just like interfering with the course of human history and because we have important things to do and to get to and, 
And so why did you come here? If this guy's gonna go on and on and, and not get to the point. Okay, so out of compassion for you, <laughs> I will tell you the advice I gave these two people. Don't hurry. That was it. Don't hurry. Not hurrying is as important as all the things I said. Hurrying is a sickness. It's epidemic. We spread it into our society. It's a social, for some people, it's almost like a social necessity. Okay, some people, you kind of have to let people know you're busy and have a lot going on. And, you know, heaven forbid that you're not doing anything. You know, I'm busy, you know. And, um, and there's so much pressure behind doing, being busy, all the things we're doing. And it involves attachment to something. It involves sometimes deep fear, deep sense of self and what we need and ambition, deep sense of worthiness. Do you have to do this? You know, I have to, I have to get these things done so I'm worthy and successful. It's tied to so many aspects of our inner life that if we just go along doing it unconsciously, we're missing one of the great golden opportunities to understand ourselves. You know, the idea of hurrying to come to IMC, it goes against the very thing we want to do here. So I suggested to these people a few ways in which to not hurry. One was to uh, plan ahead and always add extra time for things you're gonna do. If you're gonna get someplace, go someplace, give yourself five minutes, 10 minutes more than you normally would that was a reasonable to time to get there. Just get more, just in case there's issues that come up, you know, traffic or whatever, so that when you get there, you're not rushing in, but you get there and you can maybe sit out on a bench for two minutes or just look at the trees or just take your time and stroll in or, or heaven forbid you get there early and you have to talk to someone or you could talk to someone. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, that's, you know, that we don't do that. I mean, because we have these, you know, time-saving devices that we take with us all the time. So we save so much time now by, you know, checking our email, checking for text, responding to them. I mean, imagine if you didn't respond to them when you had a free five minutes. You'd be so busy later. And that would be terrible, right? So you might as well be busy, busy now because later <laughs> you want to be busy doing other things. <laughs> so, you know, you want to, so we're busy now so we can be busy later so we can be busy over and over again. Now, not all of you are this way. I know that some of you maybe are retired, but I've been told by retired people that they've never been busier. So some people are busy working. Like those of you who are really in your working year, time of your life and you're like, okay, I, I got to put up with this now just so that I can get to the time of my life where I stop being busy. Unless there's some really deep self-reflection, some really something deep and changes inside, it's so easy to have this sickness of hurry be kind of become almost like hardwired in. It becomes momentum or habit of mind. Partly because some of the mo- motivation for it is deep-seated anxiety that maybe is unarticulated what we're anxious about, what we're afraid is going to happen. But, uh, but that anxiety can kind of get almost kind of seared into the psyche so that it's not easy to stop it. It just continues and working. And, and it's possible to be anxious, very anxious, for no reason, no discernible reason. It's just a habit. It's just a kind of like a policy. It's just a sense of insecurity, a sense of fear, which is so pervasive, it doesn't have to have a reason. It's just kind of like, this is how it is. And how much of hurry arises out of fear? How much of hurry arises out of unnecessary ambition? 
So the kind of values, the kind of insight, the kind of spiritual freedom that mindfulness is about uh, uh, is more quickly found, if you want to do it quickly, if you're in a hurry, if you slow down. So, so, so I was going through a few things you can do. So five, ten minutes, give yourself a little extra time when you're going to do things. So you're not caught by surprise and then rushing. If you're doing a number of things through the day, choose one thing to do less, to not do that day. So you have a little bit more space in the day. And you're not going always filling your day with every possible moment to do things and all that. The, um, a wonderful thing that I discovered many years ago was uh, there were times when I would feel in a hurry that I had a lot of things to do and I didn't have enough time to do them. And this was not good news. And I would feel the pressure of that. And I learned that when I felt that pressure, the best thing I could do was stop and meditate for 10 minutes. And when I stopped meditating, I, had, I seemed like I had a lot of time to do my things. And I learned that this idea of time pressure is partly a construction of the mind. And it, it kind of, as a way, the mind kind of constructs t- a, a sense of time and and long time, short time. And we kind of live in this constricted way in which the mind organizes itself. Meditate and you loosen up this constricted thoughts and claustrophobia in the mind, and it can feel like there's lots of time. I learned this when I was in the Zen monastery. For one year I was a cook in the kitchen, and the kitchen was a high pressure place. And the Zen monastery lunch had to be served exactly at the minute. I forget when it was. Maybe it was twelve around 12 o'clock, but it was by the minute. Because Zen monasteries are choreographed places. Like everything's on a time schedule and there's all this kind of complicated ritual that's involved around especially like meals and all these people are involved and people are chanting and bowing and the food had to show up just at a particular moment, when it, at a particular point in the chants as people are chanting. So it's like a you know, big choreographed production. And, uh, and people are lined up in robes. The whole, it's quite something. It's quite a production with costumes and <laughs> bells and drums. And, and, you know, it's quite something. So that food had to be, you know, you know, be part of that, you know, the show. You know, had to show up. You can't, you can't make a show, right? And, and suddenly there's, okay, now it's time for the dancers. And they're, well, they're not ready. <laughs> okay, so they... So what is it, you know, what do they do on TV? You know, okay, TV audience, we're waiting. Anyway, so it was like that. So we had to be, so, it was a, so there was a lot of pressure to get the food out on time. And so sometimes, depending on the meal or something, it was, you know, and 10 minutes before the meal was going to be served up, we had to, everyone in the kitchen had to stop what they were doing. Maybe it was 15 minutes. Uh, was it 15? Do you remember? And, uh, and go, go into this little altar with a Buddha in the kitchen. So you did this, right? Yeah, you know this thing. And, uh, and so we're rushing, you know, hurrying, right? Getting everything ready. And then someone rings a bell and everyone has to stop. Everyone has to stop <coughs> and show up at the altar. And we have to chant the Heart Sutra, which doesn't take that long to chant. Three minutes? You know? To, but I would, when I first got in the kitchen, it was like, it's like, oh! <laughs> can't stop <laughs> you know that we just we have to get this ready and it's like just before it's supposed to be served up and you know and so we had to stop it always worked out it always worked out yeah good <laughs> and um so um so I, that's where i learned this little trick that if i feel like i'm too much is going on sit and meditate and 10 minutes, and it just seemed like just that suddenly there was much more space and much less pressure and felt like more time. So meditating can be supportive for this. Um, but I think the primary thing I want to get across today is uh, the op- how the opportunity to look at hurry is really useful. Partly we slow down, do less, so we can look at why we're hurrying. What are we doing when we're hurrying? And what I'd like to suggest also is hurry 
is not necessarily being slow. It's possible to be quick without hurrying. Hurrying is a state of anxiety, a state of feeling rushed, a, 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 a feeling of pressure inside that's very compelling that does not have to be the same as being quick. Um, it's, uh, I've, I, I work, after I worked the year in the kitchen at uh, the Zen monastery, some years later, I, um, I worked at a fast food restaurant called Greens. <laughs> 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 and uh, I was a cook there up in San Francisco. It's a large vegetarian restaurant. And, um, and um, we had to serve up the food quickly. And I loved it. And I would spin around the kitchen. I'd have different dishes cooking at the same time. And it was like an absorption. It was like doing Tai Chi or Qigong fast. Or I just got I didn't feel hurried, but I loved the quickness of it, the engagement of it. And um, uh, same thing at the same monastery we, we, we were at. Uh, um, I was the first person who was um, first person who was assigned to use the new dishwashing machine. Before I came there, just before I came there, all the pots and dishes were done by hand. And they had all the you know, production line of people who were doing everything. And they installed a, a dishwashing machine. So I was the first one assigned. No one knew how, much, how difficult, how much time it took to do dishes. So, um, so I was assigned that summer to do it, and I was young, and I worked, you know, worked hard at it. And then the next year, I walked by the dishwashing shack to see, and they had three people in there. How did that happen? I did it alone. <laughs> it, it was really too much work for, you know, for really for someone to do. But I loved it. I didn't hurry, but I, I liked the intensity of the work, and I spun around in the dishwashing shack, and t- two hands working at once, and... I loved, I was so present doing it that when I left dishwashing sack and went to meditate, I got concentrated right away. I was so still. It was so good, so nice. So what I learned was how to do things quickly without rushing, without being anxious, but the, the kind, of, kind of to be fully absorbed in a nice way, engaged without distracting thoughts, without self-deprecating thoughts, without stressful thoughts, just doing this one activity. And it could be done quickly in a very nice way. So not hurrying does not have to mean being slow. But for most people who are caught up in, hur- in hurry, they might have to slow down for a while to see what the, the pressure is and to stop and really take a good look at the pressure. So here's an exercise around hurry. If you do things slowly and you feel the pressure that you have to hurry, oh no, This is a radical thing. At that moment, stop. Sit down if you can. Close your eyes if you can. And just take a good, honest assessment. What's really going on in here? What are the emotions that are operating? What are the beliefs that are operating? What is it that has gripped your stomach? What is that that's gripped your your eyes? What are eyes like that are hurrying eyes? You ever looked at your eyes when you feel hurried or feel stressed and how they operate differently than you're relaxed? Have you ever felt your stomach or your shoulders? Have you ever looked at your posture when you're in a hurry versus when you're relaxed? Stop and take a really good look and study what's going on. And the reason for this in Buddhist practice is that it's more important, I would say, in in Buddhist practice not to live in ideal way. Like now you think you have to, if you're a good Buddhist, you have to kind of be slow and do everything, you know. It, you know, it, rather than living in an ideal way, it's actually much more significant and useful to understand wh- how and why you live the non-ideal way, the non-beneficial way. What are the forces that drive you this way? What are the motivations and beliefs and feelings and messages you have that you're living by? Because if you can stop and really understand yourself, understand how those things work, then um, you're wise about them. And if you're wise about them, then when they come in again, you say, oh, I know you. I I know not to believe you. I know, be careful now. But if you think that you have to only live, like say, slow life or a calm life, 
and that's and you hold yourself that way, but don't understand how you get caught into hurry, then you might slip into it all too easily. Does that make sense? So uh, all the way back to the time of the Buddha, wisdom was often uh, discussed in terms of understanding how you get in trouble, as opposed to wisdom about how great everything is, or how to be you know, the ideal, wonderful spiritual life. You understand how you get in trouble, so you don't have to get in trouble. And if you go, don't get in trouble, then you live the appropriate life of the time. If you're trying to live the ideal, the ideal might not be appropriate for all circumstances. And so you're kind of misaligned with the situation that you're involved in. So that's my little thing today. And uh, so we'll give ourselves lots of time now, no hurry, <laughs> and see if you guys can manage that. Some, some of you have a lot of things to do and need to hurry. And once a Dharma talk ends, you know, just, you, know, you, 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 know, you have other things to do. So you're welcome to rush out. <laughs> <laughs> But if you would like to ask any questions or would like to protest or <laughs> which I'd be interesting to hear anything um, or comments, testimonials that would be great. So if you could use the mic please that Morgan has. Uh, just a comment. Uh, it's interesting you say that it's synchronistic. Yes, in the past few weeks I've been doing exactly what you suggested which is I'm giving myself 15 minutes before I reach any appointment, uh, only in an effort so that I can meditate before I have the appointment, be it a doctor or something. And I'm finding I'm definitely calmer for whatever appointment I go to. And also it gives me a window where if there's a traffic situation or something, it doesn't stress me out. I say, oh, I have more time, you know. And part of the thing I also want to do is in practicing generosity, I want to, like, if people are broken down or something, I want to step and help and help them or something. Fantastic. So if you do things extra time, then you're available to help people who are going along. Totally. They did this study, uh, a famous psychological study of uh, college students who were, I think, in a seminary. So they were like studying to be clergy or something. I think that was what it was. Some of you might remember the study better. And they were supposed to give a sermon, a 10-minute sermon on the Good Samaritan. And uh, that was kind of, they were told that was the experiment, kind of. And they were in one part of the campus, and they had to go to the other part of campus in order to give this, this sermon. And so they had one group of these seminarians who were given lots of time to get to where they had to give their talk. And the other group who were told, oh, you know, you're late, and you have to get there quickly because this is important. And then they had someone along the way who was distressed, Someone who was on the ground moaning and poor, you know, some, you know some, so having some trouble. And they're going to give the talk on the Good Samaritan, right? <laughs> and the ones who are in a hurry, a great majority of them walked right by the person in distress because they had the important things to do. So if we don't hurry, we're, uh, we're able to support our fellow humans better. Thank you very much for that. And one final thing, you know, sometimes I have a tough time getting my morning and evening sits. But if I have like four different events, 15, 15, 15, it adds up to an hour, you know, so that's how I squeeze in my meditations on a tough day. So. Nice, very nice. Right, right here in the middle, Bill. I'm not sure if I was hurrying or just driving fast. I mixed up the time tonight with another event on Wednesday night, and I was driving here, and oh, I'm going to be late. It's quarter to seven. Where is everyone? <laughs> so I realized I was hurrying, so I just lay down on the bench, and it actually I realized that it started at 7.30. So I experienced that just coming here tonight, and I, I, I think it's extremely relevant to the way we live our life. No, no question about it. So you ended up with 45 minutes empty time because you came here and... Started. I was chilled out and watched the clouds. <laughs> wow, is that legal? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think it's legal in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> right behind you. That was a lovely talk. Uh, what if you're being hurried along by someone else? Sometimes we have a whole system in place just to hurry you along. 
at work, Well, I mean, I wonder about that. I mean, someone else might be in a hurry, and maybe we have to go with them, but isn't that the time where you could contentedly be quick? Yes. You don't have to take on the hurry, you can just take on the quick. It seems almost like you are, you're part of the moment only when you're hurrying along with them, but I agree with you. Yeah, you, can be, you, can, you can be quick, if it seems appropriate, you can be quick with them, but you don't have to be anxious. There are some times when, I, um, when I've been quick. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it happened a few weeks ago where I, w- I was a little bit late to meet with someone down the street someplace. And uh, so I thought, you know, I should, you know I'm late. And uh, I'm not, I don't want to hurry, but I do want to be quick. So I ran. And I was just so happy. I had a big smile on my face. And I, was, I felt so lucky that I could run. And it felt vital and nice. And I didn't feel hurried, but I, I you know... I was kind of. I arrived kind of happy. Oh, look at me! And you know, I, I, I got to run. <laughs> so. Um Feels feels related. I uh, I've been arguing with my dad in my head for the last uh, couple of days, a little bit, um, about not so much about hurrying, but about needing to. Feels like it's about trying to get more things done, but actually, um, specifically about like, um, I don't know. I've, I've been working a lot the last couple of weeks more than I way more than I'd ever like to do. And um, he was saying, oh, but sometimes you got to you got to do that and work hard and stuff. And I'm feeling like there's this piece of uh, taking care of myself and holding balance between the work and everything else that sustains me and also which sustains the work. So, not sure what I'm asking exactly, but yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, for uh, for whatever wisdom is in this idea of not hurrying, um, it does touch into some important uh, and difficult issues in our life: the issue of balance and priorities and appropriate sacrifice of our well-being for certain things that we have to we want to do, and um, the. Um, so you have to kind of, anybody has to assess, you know, if, if we have things that required of us, uh, you know, if we have a family and we're trying to keep them fed and we don't have a good salary and we have to do it, lots of work and maybe you have two jobs and then we have to come home and make them dinner and breakfast and it's just like some people's lives are really intense and very challenged with this. and. Can they afford to have a balanced life? Can they afford to go exercise? Can they afford to do other things? And unfortunately, some people in our society can't do that. It's 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 a hard and, and you know, cost of living around here is difficult, and to make it all work. And so uh, there are there are you know, social and economic and all kinds of reasons why uh, someone might feel like they have to do a lot, pack it in, and and feel harried because, you know, for good reason they're trying to take care of a lot. And it seems like it's the only thing they can do is to sacrifice certain things that are healthy in order to survive uh, in the situation. So how do we how do we f- uh, figure out where that what the appropriate thing is to do for our lives? Certainly, from a mindfulness and Buddhist point of view, uh, ideally we would look at our life and look at what we're doing, and we would do things wisely. We would do things that would support us for our. Uh, physical health or spiritual health or psychological health because it's only when those things become healthy that the benefits, the full benefits of meditation, of mindfulness really kind of fill our life and make a difference in our life. It's hard to do it when we live imbalanced. But do we have it, sometimes we don't have a choice or sometimes we have a higher a goal that's really important that requires to be imbalanced. For me, when I was, uh, went to graduate school, I'd been a monk for 10 years and when I got into graduate school, uh, my first two years when I was doing a master's, it was so obvious to me that in this environment, this new environment, trying to make, make sense of it, how to figure it all out, I had to learn to write. I didn't really know how to write English. I was in graduate school, you know. I, was, I had so much to learn. 
And um, and I, I said, I knew that I was capable of having a much calmer mind than I had in graduate school. And, and I said, well, I know I can do it, but that's not the name of the game right now. I can't expect to have a calm mind. Uh, you know, if I'm going to be doing this graduate thing, maybe someone else would know how to have a calm mind. <laughs> But, it, it, you know, it wasn't like anxious mind, but it was like, we're not going to be as calm and settled as it was had been when I was a monastic. And I thought, this is part of the deal. You know, it goes along with the territory. That this, is what, this is what's needed right now. So sometimes there are sacrifices in our well-being, certain kinds of well-being, certain kind of activities and doing, because we need to accomplish something uh, for, for the long term. So there are, are all kinds of things that can push us to, to live in an imbalanced way or sacrifice certain healthy things for certain goals, um, and there's many reasons why. But I think uh, the thing, in terms of the topic of today, the, the idea of not hurrying, uh, I think that uh, w- uh, hurrying is really debilitating. And so even people who are have, to, have to, for economic reasons, you know, really be working hard and full time and overtime and get up early and go to bed late, uh, I think that if they're hurrying, um, I think that drains some of their vitality, some of their health, and all these things. So the art of it then would be how to be quick without hurrying. And uh, I think it's possible. Uh, so because other, you know, I mean, and I'm not saying that solves all the problems of these kind of situations of economic distress, but um, but I think that uh, we can, um, you know, if we differentiate it quick versus hurry. It's kind of like the hurry is the extra that's not needed on top of the quick when we have to be quick. So I don't know if I addressed your concern. Your, your, what your question you raised was important and, and valuable, but it was my attempt to try to touch the territory of your question. Is that you want to ask some more, or is that close enough? I don't think I had anything in particular, really. Uh-huh. It was just something that felt like being expressed so, so. but uh, but one thing you I mean I appreciated uh-huh. everything you said but one thing that um, towards the beginning came up for me was oh part of what you talked about um, needing to or feeling like in this case um, is part of my dad's conditioning um, from from yeah. long ago that's yeah. continued um, yeah there can be a lot of which pressure is helpful. From, there can be a lot of pressure from others that we have to do more and accomplish more and get get ahead and things like that that can be part of this uh, contagion of hurry sickness. I saw you first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so maybe we'll do two more, and that we'll do two more, and maybe pass this mic to Judith. And that way, maybe we'll try to aim to end a little bit early. And then you'll just have more time to drive home in a relaxed way. Wouldn't that be radical? (laughs) Yes, please. Um, Thank you for this talk. Um, My question kind of has to do with um, the previous question as well as the motion. Hold it closer. Um, My question is about... It might not be on. Is, Is there a green light on this side? Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> uh, my question has to do with um, the fear of letting others down. So oftentimes when I hurry, it's because like I need to be there on time, I'm going to let them down, or I'm wasting their time, um, those types of things. Um, and for me, I'm often late. So, And I know that hurrying hurts me, so I end up not like just enjoying the time and saying, like I'm going to be late, and that's just how it's going to be. Um, but then there's the added layer of guilt then on top of that. So instead of adding like the hurrying layer, I add another different arrow, right? right. right. Well, I love your, your, your using the word layer because there's layers and layers of things to look at in what you're talking about now. Yeah. So certainly the whole guilt thing in Buddhism. See, Buddhism considers guilt an unnecessary emotion. So that makes it interesting. Like, why is that extra? Why is it unnecessary? Is there another way to t- take care of this without guilt? Uh, so that's a whole interesting layer. And then, uh, and then it has something to do with our relationship to other people. Um, I had a, a very strong uh, fear that operated in my life 
that uh, could be was represented by my fear of rejection. So my relationship with other people was very much complicated by this. And so I'm not saying that's your situation, but to look at uh, the, our, our social dynamics and what are fears and needs and understandings about this. And there might be for you something extra there as well that's kind of entangled and made complicated here. Another thing is, how did you get yourself in a situation to begin with where you're in a hurry to go get them? You had it, you said you're going to meet at 2 o'clock and at 1.55 you're 20 minutes away. How did you end up there? <laughs> uh, you know, a wise life, uh, I think for many people around here at least, involves planning. And so sometimes it needs... Uh, I've, 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 there was a period of time in my life here in, in uh, Silicon Valley where um, I used to have a written date book, right? And I used to uh, really take time to look at my date book, look at the day, and actually think carefully a number of things. Uh, what's the best way to sequence things? How much time should I give to this? How can I ensure that I'm more kind of relaxed in how I do it? And, and more interestingly for me was, uh, what's the primary <coughs> deepest intention that I wanted to manifest or express in those activities. And when I did that consciously as a little kind of exercise, I ended up adding into my activities much more beneficial intentions than I did if I just kind of like to go shopping. I have to go shopping, okay. But if I looked at the date book, I'm going shopping, I put it in there, shopping. You know, I could go shopping to try to bring really nice food for my family and care for them and love them and with food, that's a, you know, good way to love people. And that's a lot nicer to do for that reason than just go shopping. So planning, planning is good. And uh, if you are planning, and if you aren't planning successfully enough to have space for this, and it's chronic that you're late for people, then um, I think some kind of reevaluation is necessary. You didn't say it was chronic, maybe it's just occasional. But I, I think I'm speaking for a good number of people that we're, we pack in too much so sometimes it takes, you know, dropping things. You think I'm addressing you well enough or am I just kind of making things up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to answer. Oh, uh, no, I think that's good enough. That. Yeah, thank okay. you. Good enough is good enough. <laughs> good. So, so Judith. Uh, two <coughs> slogans, one on my grandmother's wall. It uh-huh. said, the hurrier I go, the behinder I get. <laughs> And the other one is a bumper sticker that says, I'm not in your hurry. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're in my irritation. <laughs> well, that was the p- other piece I was going to add. When, when somebody's tailgating yeah. me, especially at night with lights, but any time, I, I would get irritated, upset. We had a whole conversation going, right? And then I started, if the, if the roadway allowed, I would just pull over. Beautiful. Let so, them go. So what you said up there, what's your name up there? Okay. That um, the, um, you know, if you give, for example, if you give yourself more time to drive somewhere, then you can have all these little acts of generosity on the road. You go first, or I'll get out of the way for you, or, you know, you know there's, there's little things you can do rather than cutting people off and rushing and, you know, you know where there's no generosity. But to drive with generosity or to drive in such a way that you appreciate something. <laughs> I mean, you know, our lives are, for those of us who have cars and drive on these freeways, it's pretty amazing. I mean, don't you, aren't you just amazed and awe? I mean, where did this happen? How did this happen? I mean, it's technologically so sophisticated, so amazing. And what all the pieces have to come together just to work as well as it does. I mean, I don't know what's happening in the rest of the world anymore, but... I grew up in places where, you know, you'd call to ask to get a telephone installed in your home and it would take maybe four weeks and then they might not show up. And, uh, you know, in four weeks to get a phone? I mean, you know, we call up now and they come the same day. And Anyway, we live in an amazing world. And if you hurry, it's much harder to appreciate it. If you hurry it's much harder to love the people around you. If you're hurry, it's much harder to appreciate yourself. If you're hurry, it's much harder to be mindful. If you're in a hurry, it's harder to be compassionate. If it's in a hurry, it's harder to be wise. 
if it's in a hurry, it's harder to be in touch with your deepest values. If you're in a hurry, it's harder to actually see other people for who they are, as opposed to letting your biases and unconscious assumptions and beliefs have the upper hand. Hurry is a way of letting what's often kind of the surface bias op- to operate in our lives, uh, kind of unconsciously, because it's, it's ready to go there. But if we're not in a hurry, we have much more chance not to let bias and prejudice and all these things operate kind of subconsciously and we can stop and look and be wise and kind of see each other with mutual appreciation and love and care. And The benefits of not hurrying are immense. So, don't hurry. <laughs>